Welcome back to the end of the week podcast. And we've got three things on the agenda. We're going to talk about the supreme month of November as far as the US equity market is concerned. So we'll look to deconstruct that. Why did it have such an amazing month? In fact, the best November since 1980. We'll do a little bit of a pop quiz on how the Magnificent Seven performed and maybe a few others, and also what a couple of the big Wall Street year-end targets are looking like for the end of next year, because there's been a few more, and there's a little bit of divergence as well in terms of what they think for the, the year ahead. Then, of course, we're going to talk about Elon. I'm sure everyone has seen the clip by now, so I'm going to refrain from swearing in the show opening here, and I'll save that for the segment <laughs> um, for exactly what he said. Um, but we'll talk about that, talk about Twitter, discuss maybe a few ideas of you know why this is happening, why he's doing this, if we can, if there is any method to the madness, that is. Uh, and then we'll also talk about the Cybertruck as well, which came out this week. And then to finish, we're going to have a look in the oil market and talk about the OPEC plus meeting, which of course was delayed because of the scrub scrubbling that was going on between all the different nations. So to kick things off, as I said, we had a really good finish. So we're recording this on the 1st of December. We finished up 8.9% for the month in November, the Ooh. second best November since 1980. A uh, few other stats here. The VIX volatility index, uh, the fear gauge is hovering around its lowest levels since before the pandemic now. Um, to give you an idea, I was looking at the heat map of the S&P 500. So I'm going to ask you for who was the worst and who was the best performer out of the Magnificent Seven? Ooh, in the, just in the month of November? Yeah. Ooh. What type uh, of percentage are we looking at, do you think? Ooh, I'll give a you a question. clue. The, wor the worst performer was up 7%. Was up 7 Okay. <laughs> uh, worst performer, Google? Correct. Okay. Okay, if you're going to play easy, that game, that was you're the play that game give me the full, full sequence then. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> well, Google, because they've just been having a worse time of it in this kind of open AI race or AI race, I should say. Um, so I would say the best performer then, it might, maybe it's Tesla. Correct. Ooh, all right, on a roll. What do you reckon they were up in the last four weeks? It's probably double digits then, is it? Uh, 11%. 20. The oh, bloody hell. Wow. <laughs> really? 19.5 to be precise. Wow. Okay. Crazy, isn't it? Decent. Then I'm going to go Microsoft, number two. Microsoft number three, up 12%. Okay. Is it Amazon then? They've had decent. Amazon number five, up 9.8%. Okay. Right. I should have just stuck with my first two guesses. The, the wheels are coming off here. So who's <laughs> number two then? NVIDIA. Okay. Yeah. They're up 15. Apple up 11. Uh, Meta, second worst, only up 8.6%. <laughs> um, bank, bank stocks, check this one out. Uh, JP up 12, City up 17, wow. BlackRock up 23%. That's uh, that's pun that's some punchy number. I mean, for those big tech firms, well, tech, right, you know, they're normally, that, that, that kind of sector, the share prices are normally more volatile. So you expect bigger numbers. Banks are definitely less volatile. So they're, they're, they're huge figures for, so, for so bank what, stocks. What would explain BlackRock up 10% more than JP Morgan? Well, I'd say that's just a direct function of the fact they're an asset manager. So they derive their revenue from uh, charging a fee on the value of the assets under management. And so ultimately, if the if if stocks go up, best month, what did you say for yep, a long time? 1980, yeah. Best November, yeah. Bonds, they've had their best month, depends what you look at, but the Bloomberg US Aggregate Bond Index has had its best month since 1985. That's just any month, not just a month of November. Any month, best since 1985. Here's a question back at you. So if you think like the S&P went up, what did you say, 8.5%? 
Yeah. So what do you think the percentage rise was for the US Bloomberg US aggregate bond index? Oh. 18%. <laughs> no, you've gone the wrong way. <laughs> 4.3. So bonds are less volatile. Well, at least. I, th- I was thinking like bonds got absolutely crushed. Yeah. I was thinking, well, maybe they've just got um, an exaggerated bounce. There's, there's, yeah, it's a bit more, it's, it's way broader that US aggregate bond index, I would say, than the S&P is broader in so much as in there you've got everything from treasuries, US government bonds, all the way through to high yield, you know, US corporate junk bonds. So there's a there's a huge so I'm, I'm sure if you went down to that higher yield end of the spectrum, then you probably did get numbers mm. well into the double digits, because um, there's way more volatility down there. So so what I guess before we move on then, two things. What exactly, just in a shorthand statement, because this is something that I guess a lot of students would be asked in a potential interview situation. They're like, okay, yeah. great. We all know it all went up. Why did it go up? Yeah. So what would be a, a neat way to package that up? Well, everything went up, apart from one thing, which is the US dollar that went in the exact opposite way, or all for the same single reason. But yeah. Asset prices through the roof, US dollar value dropping. So this is all about the story we've been banging on about forever, which is, right, it's it's about future interest rate expectations. What's the Fed going to do with interest rates in the future? We know they're at the top of the hiking cycle. So it's just about when are they going to cut? And we've been talking about this for weeks. I mean, we were talking about how Goldman's were saying, right, they're going to start to cut um at the end of 2024, but Morgan Stanley are predicting that they were going to cut mid-2024. And so it's all about when are they going to cut and what's happened in the last week. There's been a very notable shift in the market consensus expectation as to when cuts are going to start. So pre this event, we were thinking end of 2020, you know, second half of 2024, probably in the autumn, right? That's just shifted now to the first half. And it's shifted to May. So now they're pricing in a 25 basis point rate cut by the Federal Reserve in the May 2024 meeting. Why? Why the sudden change? Because of this guy called Christopher Waller. So he's on the FOMC. So he's one of the rate setters at the Federal Reserve. And he made some comments at a conference. um, And they are what you call dovish comments. So he was... I'll explain in in the the details in a second. But the key thing here, why did markets sort of swing and react so much is because normally Christopher Waller is one of the more hawkish members of the FOMC. So he's normally the one going, right, we should be hiking rates, you know, very much about tightening policy. And for him to come out and say some dovish comments, dovish just meaning, right, we're going to cut rates or loosen policy. For him to say it, is way more meaningful than if another member of the committee had said the same thing, but they're already normally dovish. It wouldn't have had much of an impact. But this guy's now shifted his stance, which is a measure and an indication that the whole Federal Reserve Committee, on average, has shifted to a more dovish place. Basically, what he was talking about was real interest rates. So, what is what are real because we always talk about the interest rate what's the federal reserve's interest rate 5.75 percent so what's the real interest rate well then that's just taking into account inflation so the real interest rate which is ultimately thought to be you know ultimately that that's a, a more accurate truer reflection of the cost of borrowing as well as the yield you get on savings So the real interest rate is just the nominal interest rate, i.e. the interest rate set by the central bank, minus inflation. So if the Fed want to keep interest rates unchanged, right, but you've got inflation falling, well, then actually, even if they keep rates unchanged, if inflation's falling, well, then actually the real interest rate is, is, is going up. Because you're 
remember it's nominal rates minus inflation but if the minus inflation bit is getting smaller the net outcome is higher right so he, his point was look if inflation continues to trend down us doing nothing means rates are going up so he's saying we may well look at cutting interest rates not to boost economic growth or we're worried about deflation or we're worried about the economy slowing too fast nothing to do with that purely we will cut rates purely to maintain the real interest rate. So this was kind of quite a big curveball. And suddenly everyone's talking about real interest rates again. And, and that explanation has really altered people's predictions as to when the Fed might start to make a move. So another word that I saw quite often this week was Goldilocks. People mm. referring to this. Uh, Goldilocks type environment, which um, perhaps you could explain a bit more about what that is in this kind of context. Well, it's not too hot and it's not too cold. <laughs> it's just right. Okay. So this is um, referring to, you know, like the economic conditions, okay, whereby they're not too hot. So too hot means the economy's growing too fast upside inflation pressure right we've got to hike interest rates to try and curb that too cold is the opposite where you're you know you're getting the economy going the other way just right is where we get the sweet spot of the economy's growing and actually we had gdp figures for the for quarter three announced earlier this week for the us um which got revised up so 5.2 percent um growth annualized that is in quarter three which is i mean just stellar right huge growth figure so the economy is doing really really nicely inflation's coming back down so we've got this scenario where economic conditions are really good and the fed aren't going to be hiking anymore and if waller's to be believed quite the opposite so you might even have this phenomenal scenario where you've got really good economic conditions and you're getting rate cuts so for asset prices like stocks, I mean, that's like absolutely sweet spot. That's your Goldilocks. Um, so, yeah, people are starting to get a little bit excited, I would say. OK, well, there's one there's one bank on the street that's not getting excited. Ah, Morgan Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know what? Your man, Mike. Uh, seems to have got out the right side of bed this time. Oh. Uh, he definitely sits on the bearish side. Yeah, He's not the biggest bear on the street. So Morgan Stanley is, well, Goldman's are forecasting 4,700 for the S&P year end. Morgan Stanley and Barclays 4,500. JP Morgan are going for 4,200. Uh, right. As context, Bank of America are going 5,000. Deutsche are looking for 5,100. Interesting. So JP, their rationale. So let me let me give you both ends of the scale here. Yeah. So with JP Morgan, most bearish on the street, they're saying global growth decelerates, household savings shrink, geopolitical risks remain high with national elections, including those in the US, which could add policy volatility. Okay. Summary. Yeah. Uh, Deutsche. Corporate earnings to remain resilient, even if the United States experiences a mild, short recession. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I, yeah, it's very bare. I mean, to give context here, the, the S&P is trading at 4,568. So those saying 4,500, I mean, they're basically saying it's not going to move. It'll be exactly where it is now in 12 months time. Um. Saying that, saying that, if you've got the chart up, yeah, go look at the last twelve months. Yep. So where were we trading? What was the ago. respective low and high over that twelve month period to give us an idea of the yeah. variance of movement? Okay. So twelve months ago, uh, start of December twenty twenty two, trading at four thousand. Okay. Dipped a bit into year end, and actually the low of. The whole year of 2023, the low, well, so far, I guess, you know, you never know, but um, <laughs> the low was at 3,800 and that was on January the 5th. So right at the very start of the year. 
Um, we've then rallied and actually the high so far, and this could be broken, was on the 31st of July, which was at 4,588. So we're sat like just 20 points off the summer high. Um, so if there were if there were any more upside into year end, then we will be, you know, finishing on the high. We started on the low. So, you know, a workout to be a you know very tasty 12 month period um for the index. Um so yeah, we're kind of right up at the top end of the year's range. Um 4,200 would take us kind of take us back to levels. We dipped below that at the end of October. And the reason for why November's got these crazy figures in terms of the amount of upside, it, it's the timing of the 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 kind of wave pattern of this market. The the big nosedive low was on October the 27th down at 4,100. And that was the absolute low of what was a really big sell-off. And then we just pinged higher right from day one of November through to through the, through to the end. Um, so, so it sounds quite <clears throat> straightforward until you go back in time eight weeks and you're like, higher for longer, sell everything. And then you go forward four weeks, no cut rates, buy yeah. everything. So what's to say that this can't flip again on its head. Well, ab well, absolutely. And it can, and it could do, you know, I, I think the most important thing between now and the end of the year is the inflation data for November that will get released about halfway through the month. And then we've got a Fed meeting on the 13th of December. So really, if that inflation figure comes in lower than last month, we had a big drop last month which is why people have got excited again and why Waller's starting to say, hang on, we might need to cut rates. So if inflation goes down again, then I think that's your further evidence that actually rate cuts are going to happen sooner. But look, if that inflation number jumps back up, then right, we're going to massively seesaw maybe back to the panic mode of, oh no, rates are going to have to stay this high for, for much longer and yeah, you'll get the seesaw swing back down to the to the downside into year end. So yeah, it's a pretty pretty important number that which will come halfway through the month. Cool. All right. Well, look, let's let's move on uh, and let's talk a little bit. Elon Musk, who yeah what's made the, made made the headlines again this week. What's the swear? Do we have a swearing policy on this podcast? <clears throat> well, yes. You can only swear if it's repeating verbatim of what someone else has said okay not allowed to swear yourself that's the the rules okay as long as it's a direct quote yeah okay perfect so, so do you have the quote do you want do you want to take the honors yeah the quote <laughs> well the quote was go fuck yourself is that clear i hope it is I actually think he said it twice, Piers. <laughs> if you're if you're gonna be verbatim. Um but yeah, he 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 said that <clears throat> I think it was like a New York uh, Times deal book conference thing and yeah. yeah, he's on a stage and it was a little bit out of left field. He obviously looked pretty disgruntled, uh, and he went on to talk about the fact that the advertising boycott was basically going to kill the company. And then he started saying, we'll let the people of planet Earth then decide it and we'll document it. Uh, it was all quite weird to watch, to be quite honest. Yeah. Con the, the context here was that there's a few parts, but essentially he endorsed an uh, anti-Semitic post on, on Twitter, uh, had a lot of backlash. The advertiser exodus began as well after a non-profit Media Matters published a report that showed advertisements from major companies alongside neo-Nazi posts. So Apple, Disney, had a little pop shot of is it Bob Iger, isn't it? The, the yeah. CEO of Disney in particular. Yeah. Uh, a few of those other big kind of household brand names who have all left uh, Twitter, I was going to say Twitter, X. Yeah. So other than this kind of headline story and other than feeling like, wow, imagine if you're the CEO <laughs> and, and Elon comes out with that. Uh, how you must feel trying to manage that fallout the next well, day. Well, on, just quickly on that front, because like the companies that have pulled out are like IBM, Apple, Walt Disney, Comcast, Warner Brothers, you know, giant organizations with giant advertising budgets. And they were kind of pulling out anyway, not just because of that anti-Semitic uh, post that Elon Musk did, but also since Elon Musk was taken over, 
um basically the uh, the, the sort of it's been relaxed in terms of you know the policing of posts has been relaxed because musk is all about free speech right and advertisers are then are fearful of you know being how having their adverts next to a tweet that is you know controversial and against their sort of ethos and whatever so they've kind of pulled out um so he hired a new ceo to come and charm them back okay her, her name's linda yaccarino so he hired her to specifically because of her connections within the media industry and and to get these advertisers back and then apparently she was in the crowd at this uh talk when he just launches this tirade and she must have just been going oh my god i mean how i mean how how is she supposed to operate do we know that kind of do thing do we know her salary like i don't know what's it what what's in this for her <laughs> well buds. well to to be the ceo of one of the big social most media about platforms. most talked about companies i guess yeah okay so up. just trying to think of i mean he obviously plays this this political line yeah where <clears throat> obviously he, he can kind of leverage down and say that this is all you know, not, I don't want to. I don't want to go into the political side. We kind of we know that point. But I was trying to think. Okay, so that aside, from a business perspective, what's his angle here? Because yeah. is he a crazy man or is he a genius? <laughs> well, yes, indeed. Um, so that, I think there's two. Either he's crazy in that he's just he just had an outburst. It wasn't planned. He just came out shoot. I don't know. Maybe he was drunk. I don't know. Shooting from the hip, just being a bit of an idiot. Maybe that was the case. Oops. In you know, and the day after he might have been going, oh shit, I shouldn't have done that. Or it's a very genius play. So here's that story. Because at the moment, right, we know what what do we know? Because we don't Twitter's not a publicly listed company anymore. He bought it, took it off the stock market right so he doesn't have to report earnings so we don't know finer details about the financial position of the firm what we do know is last july he said that we are still negative cash flow um and that we're the revenue is 50 percent down from when he bought it and that's because of advertisers pulling out right so 50 percent down maybe so that was in july Maybe things have got worse, especially after this tirade, right? Maybe things have got worse to the point where he's thinking, well, hang on a minute. This isn't going in the right direction. And the problem they've got in terms of um, financing the deal, you know, he bought Twitter for $43 billion. In terms of financing it, he borrowed $12.5 million, no, sorry, billion. Dollars. So there's $12.5 billion of debt involved here. And that was a syndicated loan. Um, from the big banks, uh, who was it? Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Barclays, and Mitsubishi Bank. So they they syndicated this loan for him, right? Thirteen billion. Let's just round it up. So that's really expensive. That's not helping that cash flow. The negative cash flow part of that story is these big interest payments that they've got to make on this debt, right? So maybe maybe Musk is thinking, hang on, this is not. I can't pull it off. So let's bury it. Let's actually go ahead and bury this thing, the company, so that I can get this debt written off. Or, I mean, like, there's an extreme case, right? The company goes bankrupt. And, okay, the liquidators come in and the debt holders, maybe they get a tiny fraction of their money back. I don't know, 5%, 10%, okay? Or most, more likely, Trump, um, Trump, Musk will go to the banks and go, look, conditions are really bad. This is go heading towards bankruptcy. So you've got two choices, banks. Either let's let it go to bankruptcy, you're going to get 5% of your money back. Or restructure the debt. Let's restructure the debt. Let's let's take a haircut, as we say, which means, right, we're going to say the debt, well, it's 12, 12 and a half billion. Let's call it 6.25 billion. So let's write off half of it, okay? With the other half, let's restructure it with a better interest rate. Help me out here, guys, to make sure this company doesn't go bankrupt. 
and then right we'll get it back on its feet so that there's maybe if he's being a genius here then i think that's probably the play where he's trying to get some of this debt written off before then the company revives and he sails off into the sunset having saved himself 6.25 billion dollars of debt repayments all while he's feeling pretty pleased with the 20 percent appreciation of tesla in, in, yes. in one month <laughs> well i guess the next 12 months then will be really interesting to see how that plays out there's also yeah. of course a political year in the u.s with an election at the end so it's definitely going to be a year of elon musk yeah for sure that's um, true and he said he said publicly that he wants trump back on the platform he's basically given him a public invite to return but of course trump has his own platform is Truth. that still going i've got apparently it is but i've got no idea on what the figures are i don't know if anyone you i don't know what the user figures are but i guess it's just full of trump's fans right so <laughs> um yeah i don't know so what in, in that scenario that you described um i like it i like that this theory so looking at it from the bank's perspective just bad deal then or well yeah i mean i i, I mean look musk is a fairly backable individual let's be honest his track record is pretty phenomenal um it's not just tesla of course but spacex you know the boring company Neuralink. he was founded open ai just in his spare time <laughs> you know he's everything he's touched has turned to gold so he's a backable guy so these banks came in and backed him um yeah it's just i think in the end for sure musk paid way over the odds for the asset and i think probably he's still a little bit pissed off about that which is maybe why he's engineering this scenario where he can get out of some of this debt that he uh used so that that'll lower the price right so if if half of the debt got taken away that's 6.25 million right so that'll take his actual purchase price down to 37 billion rather than 43 so maybe he'll feel a little bit more does make me think that may maybe take it one step genius further that this was he was kind of almost because he was already trying to battle in court wasn't he over the yeah. fee to start with from the beginning so he knew it was way too toppy yeah <laughs> well that's the, it he, he messed up in the kind of legal contract he signed you know to to do this deal he kind of he rushed it i guess and the legal clauses meant he was basically forced in the end to buy it at 43 billion when actually he didn't in the end he didn't want to but he was legally obligated to do so mm. so yeah left a bit of a bad taste okay We'll see how this goes. Yeah, more to come, I am sure. More controversy always with Elon. Um, all right, so let's take a little look about OPEC. So, well, OPEC... let's. Well, I just want to touch. You, you mentioned Tesla, of course. Mm. Oh, sorry, cyber, cyber trucks. trucks. We can't. We can't not mention the good old cyber truck here, uh, which has finally been is ready for delivery, um, like two years over schedule. Um, but it kind of got it kind of they had another kind of mini launch yesterday, um, even though it got launched back in 2019 um, in terms of the concept of it. So back in 2019, it was like, here we go, Cybertruck, we're going to change the truck world and it's going to be delivered in 2021 and it's going to cost forty thousand dollars. That's what they said in 2019. Right. Here we are. End of 2023. It's finally being delivered except the cheapest price will be $60,990. But that one's not available yet. The only one you can actually buy with the 2024 delivery date is the all-wheel drive version, which is 80000 or the Cyber Beast, which is the top end of the range, and that's $100,000. So, so that got kind of rolled out yesterday. The reason... <laughs> The reason why it was a very infamous launch back in 2019, do you remember? Because there's loads of features of this truck, which has caused a massive headache in production, which is why it's late. Um, things like it's got an ultra-hard 
exoskeleton. Basically, they're making it out of cold rolled stainless steel, um, which is bu bulletproof. I mean, only in America. Um, so apparently it's bulletproof for up to a nine millimeter handgun. Why? Um, anyway, it's got this armored glass. OK, and the launch in 2019, they were raving about all these features. And yeah, check out the glass. It's an armored glass. And basically they threw a baseball at it. Or was it a baseball bat? It was like a cannonball, a like a mini bat. cannonball thing. It was, yeah, and, it, and the glass shattered. And it was like, oh, oops. That wasn't supposed to shatter. It's supposed uh, to be. It armored. was on purpose. Did that yeah, on purpose. Well, maybe, maybe so. Oh, no, anyway, I, 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 they did it ago, again I... yesterday. They did it again yesterday. Oh, okay. And it worked. Like the glass didn't shatter. Uh, surprise, surprise. Yeah, I, I saw the build up to this launch. There's about maybe three or four weeks ago, there was a viral uh, post on, on X. And it was a video of someone filming and they had the cyber truck. You know, when you have like, um, a road test vehicle and it's all cut in like this kind of weird right cover. yeah yeah so you can't tell what it is but you know what it is yeah and then there was some then then uh it had bullet holes in the side <laughs> and it went viral because someone's driving beside this cyber truck filming it going oh look at the bullet holes man <laughs> it, obviously marketing build up to yeah to the launch oh what what i mean what a disgusting looking car but well, i mean who knows yeah. I just, I'm not, I guess I'm not the target, target market. <laughs> well, there's some crazy, this, this thing's ridiculous. Like, did you know it can do zero to 60 faster than a Ferrari? 2.9 seconds, zero to 60. I mean, it's crazy. Um, it's got some quite cool things. Like it's going to have solar, solar charging as an optional extra. So you can have solar panels in and it'll charge to increase the range which apparently is going to be up to 500 miles anyway so it's a, it's a pretty phenomenal machine um, and so are you seriously going to sit there and mention the words Ferrari and tell me that <laughs> the Cybertruck can go faster therefore you're implying that somehow you know put it, putting your foot down and a car moving like even if it's faster, you and I know that there's a there's a lot more. Even just driving straight line speed. Well, yeah. look, I all know. I can say is there's two million people on the pre order book. Yeah, but that yeah that again mate is part part of the bigger wider Musk. Yep, Musk esque ways. Where he uses his influence, his power, absolutely to shape these public opinions. To yeah, everything he does is all orchestrated to fit an engineer that results in tangible things like a two million waiting list for an absolute heap of junk. <laughs> <laughs> but, but well, anyway. they're not going to. There's real problems with production. So even though there's a two million waiting list, right next yeah. year. He only reckons they're going to be able to build 250,000, like at best. And his track record on hitting production targets is not good. So it'll probably be less than 200,000, right? So they'll let, they'll make less than 10% of the pre-order book next year. Mm. So yeah, the waiting and, list for this thing is going to be insane. Okay, you're, you're, uh, I'll tell you now, you'll be lucky to hit 10%. Yeah. The reason why is any factory line process, you can't just have a brand new vehicle with new materials and new design without fault this car will be a disaster just <laughs> like every other tesla is the worst manufactured vehicle you can buy for your money i mean don't sit on the fence <laughs> <laughs> anyhow let's move on <laughs> let's talk uh, opec opec plus um so these this would be the the group of um, nations oil producing nations namely saudi russia but a whole heap from the middle east africa but the wider plus being namely russia but does include a few other outside members but they've essentially agreed to make additional voluntary cuts to oil production in 2024 to bolster the market now the idea being here that it was quite well anticipated in the sense of general economic climate 
do they have to do more? Oil hasn't really responded to cuts done thus far. Saudi others, the kind of sweet spot is still higher than where oil is currently trading, not that far off. Uh, the sweet spot being about $80. Um, the idea being here, Saudi is the easiest example that they have uh, a budget to manage. And so they need money coming in as well as money going out. And for that book to balance, they need $80 a selling price. And at the moment, we're trading just below there. So the kind of details of the deal, Saudi Arabia pledged to extend an existing voluntary cut of 1 million barrels a day until the end of the first quarter. Russia, so this is always the kind of contentious relationship here. There's no, there is no deal unless those two deal yeah. uh, together. Just given the magnitude of the kind of weighting of the overall OPEC plus production, it's very much tilted to those two. And Russia said they were going to deepen its existing voluntary export uh, reduction to 500,000 barrels per day from 300. So they've gone another step further, essentially. Um, so the group did agree was total production curbs of 2.2 million barrels per day from eight members. Um, and that figure then uh, is around 1.3 when you're talking about the Saudi, Saudi Russia mix. So yeah, that was the, the latest. Um, one, one interesting kind of summary I saw from one analyst, he said the Saudi lollipop, the, the, the meaning of that being that it's a little uh, kind of sweetener uh, has been successfully socialized into the OPEC plus lollipop. <laughs> okay, you lost me at lollipop. <laughs> so what is this what is this voluntary word? What's the, why is that in there? Voluntary cuts? Why aren't they just saying we are cutting by X amount? Well the, the I guess the biggest problem you have here is that these countries probably the easiest way to look at this is if you were to take Saudi and Iran, uh, two countries which historically do not see eye to eye uh, for religious reasons. And so therefore, they do bat for the same team, though, when they're in OPEC, um, that being that both of them are sensitive to the value of what oil is trading in terms of their, their income as a country. So the problem you have with volunt or the pr the problem you have in trying to enforce cuts is that or well, who is exactly going to monitor, check, and enforce right. these things? Yeah. It needs to be done as a collective agreement in the greater interest of all parties. But therein lies the biggest problem, because every one of these countries is quite unique, um, economically, culturally, as I said, religiously. So it's a tough gig trying to get everyone on board. You know, you think of Saudi and Russia being critical. Obviously, Saudi aligned with the US. And at the moment, there's a war still going on in Ukraine and the West sanctioning Russia. So there's some delicate relationships for sure. Um, this meeting in itself got delayed. Uh, the delay from the meeting from Sunday was partly motivated by talks with African members in particular. Uh, Angola, Nigeria pushed back against attempts to curb their output because they're looking to revive their oil output sectors after years of underinvestment, mismanagement, civil war. Yeah. Uh, they're like, no, we need, we want to get cracking. We want to pump as much as we can get away with and sell it to make as much money as possible, which goes counter, obviously, to the objective that Saudi Arabia has, which is to try and at least um, manipulate the supply handle to offset the falling demand right uh, well that, that's a you, price so right the point of opec or opec plus right is that supply handle and them having an effect on price i would argue that they failed on that attempt this time because they've cut production by more so price should go up right but it didn't price went down i mean we had pretty big sell-off a um, couple of dollars more, more, two or three, even three dollars to the downside off the back of this announcement, which is the opposite way to what theory suggests it should go. Right. So it's the least because they didn't even have um, a the meeting was delayed, indicating, well, hang on, there's there's disagreement. And then 
they made the announcement yesterday and they didn't even have a press conference, which mm-hmm. is like, they always have a press conference. So they, you can clearly tell that there's big disagreement and this these cuts, I mean, are they even going to happen, right? You know, is it just... So here's a question. Is OPEC, are we seeing the beginning of the end of OPEC? Well, I think we, yeah, we've said this before. I think the writing has been on the wall for a, for some time. Um, yeah, particularly given the emergence as well of if you think more long term and you do think about these African nations in particular, yeah. like countries like Nigeria will in time become more powerful within that mix. For Saudi Arabia, unfortunately, the only way is down here. Um, and hence the reason why they're doing their quest to diversify. They know this. They have known this. It, the others are on the rise here. Uh, and that in itself will fracture the relationship because there will need to be a shift in power of which will be unacceptable to all parties at some point. So, yeah. yeah. It, will, it will certainly be an interesting time ahead. Uh, the the geopolitical consequence though of that fracturing could get interesting yeah <laughs> indeed for sure all right well look we will wrap it up there um thanks Pierce, as ever for your time and for everyone else have a great weekend we'll see you next week yep have a great weekend <laughs>